Chapter seven, engaging black Hebrew Israelites. What's going on, part of people, the place to be. I go by the name of the BK Apologies, transmitting all the way live. New York is the city. Brooklyn is the borough. What's good? What's popping? It is Friday. We've made it. Man, it's good. We're here to continue reviewing this amazing book, Urban Apologetics, Restoring, Restoring Black Dignity with the Gospel. And um, of course, we always got to say what's up to the part of people in the chat. We got we got Shoddy Mills in the building. We got Tyler Lott, Jonathan Green, Adrian Jones. We got apologists in Detroit. And of course, as always, tell a friend to tell a friend that's him again. Please share the link. And if you haven't, like, share, and subscribe already. Um, also, you can sh show your support, PayPal, or you could be a monthly supporter and become a patron. We get all sorts of incredible, sweet morsels of stuff that, we, I, you know, good stuff, good stuff. Do and it. Um, yes, it's a beautiful thing. And of course, we have on the panel some illustrious guests. And we have one of the bodega ladies in the building. Uh, she's going by Flora de la Cara, but we all know her as Michelle Turner. What's going on, sis? What's good, everybody? How are everybody doing today? Chilling, chilling, chilling. And Enjoy that Patreon. I promise you it was worth it. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. And of course, we have our own UA's Captain America. Kevin Benton Jr. What's going on, sir? I'm, I'm embracing the name now, man. It's just sticking. You should, uh, man. You should. It's a beautiful thing, I'm man. I'm grateful to be here, man. I have enjoyed the series so far and ready to dig in tonight, man. Nice, nice, nice. And, you know, we get into a, a particular subject that a lot of us in the UA are, are very much involved with, uh, for better or for worse, <laughs> you know, and, and it's engaging the Hebrew Israelite community. So what is your first, when you first read the chapter, tell me your first uh, 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 opinions of it. Like what's, what's the first things that really st stood out for you in the chapter? To me or Michelle? Uh, let's start with you, Kev. Yeah, Kev. Okay. Um, one, I really like how he, he builds the argument. So he starts off with explaining, one, that there's really no, um, uh, I don't even know the right, right word where there's no collective set of teaching that all of these his Hebrew Israelite groups or camps um, agree upon. So he builds the history and takes specific camps and then talks about how, you know, who founded them, why they were founded, you know, and everything and uh, what they are in search for, you know, the black identity and trying to uh, give people a sense of identity, but it's done so from a, a wrong perspective. And right. then the thing I love about it is they are really big, Hebrew Israelites are really big on misinterpreting scripture. So he goes through in the end and takes the majority of the scriptures that they use out of context and explains them in context to equip the believers that if they ever run across them, it kind of gives us um, a game plan to formulate in our mind or exposes their game plan. So I really thought it was really well written um, and different things. And so I know that uh, Dr. Mason en encounters a lot of Hebrew Israelites mm -hmm. up there in Philly. So mm -hmm. just uh, seeing him utilize that experience um, to help, uh, you know, build the body of Christ and prepare us was really uh, instrumental for me. And I, I really enjoyed it. Oh, that was, that was a, an amazing summary, bro. Thank you so much. Um, Michelle Turner, what are your first thoughts on Chapter 7? Well, Kevin kind of took my thoughts, but <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part it was when he broke down the scriptures to show, hey, this is how you refute them point by point, because it's like we have so many videos that does that, but to have it in writing to where you can reference back to it if you need to, like faster than trying to like figure out what timestamp is on a video, I thought was super helpful. Yeah. Um, and the fact that like he went through the history so now you know like where they got started. You can have, because timelines are important when it comes to um, doing the apologetics. Now you have a timeline of what the history looked like for Hebrew Israelism in the different stages that it went through. And you can kind of see which camp believes what. So if you run into somebody from ISUBK, IGJOC, um, whatever different ones they have, you can see how to engage with them because they're not a monolith either. 
Right. Uh, just like we said, we're not a and monolith. Not either. Yeah. So I'm very glad that he showed like they're not a monolith. They have different beliefs. They have different sects that um, teach different things. Um, and this is how you can engage with them. But as a whole, these are some of the scriptures that they all go to. This is how you refute those scriptures. And this is the scriptures that back up what I'm showing you. And this is the history of it. So I really was like, this is that right there is can be a training manual. Uh, like they have their yeah. welcome home packet and <laughs> their um <laughs> the and, they have, right, and their right. preset packet. Right. I was like, this is basically like our preset packet <laughs> for right, right. Israelism. And I was like, chapter six was the NOI preset packet, and now chapter seven is the Hebrew Israelite preset packet. I'm like, we got preset packet, y'all. Yeah. The one stop shop. Absolutely. Can I say something on that? Uh, to yes, BK, um, yes, I, I really enjoyed it as as I have with all the chapters. Um, but with this one in particular, because there are not a lot of books out there on Hebrew Israelites, I love looking at the footnotes. And mm. so I went back and looked at it. Every time they put a footnote in there, I always um, I tab the page in the back where these footnotes are. And I go back to look and see what sources he got that information from. So I love the fact that even Dr. Mason on one of his lives talked about how having footnotes and having sources and stuff was a very important thing for them. And what I try to do is equip myself. A lot of times when I'll, I'll go back and look at those sources and I'll go back and put them in my Amazon cart to or, order later on so that I can go a bit, you know, uh, be equipped with that other information that goes even look, maybe a little bit further than what they do. So I'm right. grateful that they put that information in there. And it shows that this isn't just something that they're just talking off of. This is something that they've researched themselves prior to writing their own chapter. So I love the scholarly approach that they took right. to it. It shows that we want to be taken seriously and we've done our homework. Um, and I think what it will do is also help a lot of Hebrew Israelites who may not be aware of their own history. And so now as a result of reading that, um, they'll be a little bit more educated and maybe it'll put a bug in their ear as a uh, Kukul would say, uh, a pebble in their shoe or something like right, that to right, get right. their mind spinning as well. No, absolutely. Uh, real quick, shout out to MJ Jackson. Thanks for the love, sir. Definitely appreciate it. Um, no, absolutely right, Kev. I mean, the us as a community, we have to dot our I's and cross our T's mm -hmm. all the time, you know, especially when dealing with like the conscious community, right? They have this, this, this saying, source up or shut up, right? If you can't provide me a source for what you're saying, I'm yeah. not going to believe you, right? Yeah. And so because we are a lot of times we do play defense, right? We're defending the gospel. We have to be sourced up, right? And and Mason does a great job of equipping us with sources so that when we have these engagements, we have all these things that we could pull from. So it's like, don't take my word for it. This is what academia is saying. This is what the, the archaeologists are saying. This is what the linguists are saying, right? So that mm -hmm. we have a, a much stronger argument so that hopefully once they're persuaded, we could get to the real business, which is giving them the gospel. Yeah. Right. Because that's that's the end game. Right. To see their soul saved onto Jesus Christ. So. But let's get into. Uh, I'm sure I can't hear you. You're muted. You're still muted. Can't hear you. you all right. So, well, you're muted now, but I'll let you work that out. And she while working from the ears, too, boy. OK, go ahead, big baller. <laughs> so. Uh, Let's just get into. So we're going to look at some of this history. All right, we're going to start with Gabriel Prosser, who was a literate enslaved blacksmith who planned a large slave rebellion in the Richmond area in the summer of 1800. All right. And um, Kev, could you read this real quick? Of course, uh, according to Israel United in Christ or IUIC and other Hebrew Israelite groups in around 1800, Gabriel Proser began teaching that blacks were the people of God. Right. Uh, and that comes in 1894. Right. And of course, you know, and you, you, you talked about it, you know, the footnotes, right? So we mm -hmm. have sources. So in this book called Gabriel's Rebellion, the Virginia Slave Conspiracies of 1800 and 1802 by Douglas Erton says, there is not a single extent primary document that supports the contention that Gabriel was a deeply religious slave or that Martin was a slave preacher. What exists instead is Thomas Henry's process 1800 description of his 24 year old property, a tall young man with short black knotty hair, right? And again, this is something that IUIC would teach, 
but I don't know how many of their members have actually dig deep into the history of this individual to see that what's being taught is not true, cannot be found in the historical record at all. Right. So here's a great resource right off, right off the bat that you can use when dealing with that particular camp, IUIC. Right. Um, let's continue here. Um, let's see, Michelle, did you fix your can you can you talk? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can talk. Yeah, so right. can you read read this yes. for us? The founder of the largest and one of the earliest African American churches to preach that black people were descended from the ancient Israelite was Prophet William Sanders Cherry Crowdy, who had a revelation while clearing his fields outside in all black town in Oklahoma in 1892. Chosen People, The Rise of American Black Israelite Religions, book by Jacob S. Dorman. Right. Again, another footnote that, that's provided in, in, in this chapter. Um, have you guys looked into these guys, this this movement by any chance? Hebrew Israelites, you mean specifically? You. <laughs> you guys. Like once once you saw the footnote, like did you ever really, you know, did more like digging into like what how these guys got down or yeah, I actually um, I did a broadcast on uh, urban apologetics before the book was actually written mm -hmm. uh, based on a lot of information from um, what's my man's name that wrote the other book, Christopher Brooks. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe his name is Christopher Brooks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, vocab had a book on Hebrew Israel, mm -hmm. Vocab Malone had a book on Hebrew Israelites. And there's another one that I had in my uh, library. So. Uh, oh, and uh, Jew three did a really good job with their uh, their book as well. Um, so I took four or five different sources that I found with some stuff on the internet and actually compiled that to look into uh, where they had come from. I was really trying to educate myself. Um, I think a lot of pastors should do more research when it comes to Hebrew Israelites, but I have this strong feeling that um, pastors who do not see, so I, I would say like the areas where I've been from, not just military communities, but even in uh, Hinesville, Georgia, um, close to Savannah, where my dad's church is, you don't see no Israel, Hebrew Israelite uh, camps down in that particular area. So for most pastors, it's not really a big thing to research them because right. they don't seem to be a threat to them at that particular moment. But mm -hmm. their reach, and I love how he talked about earlier in the book, there was a, um, a statistic that he quoted from a uh, um, one of the, uh, what they call that thing, polls. And they said it was about 1.4 million people that were adherents of this particular religion. So right. it is the fastest growing uh, black uh, religious identity cult that we have out there. And so while it may not, you don't want to wait until it's actually at your doorstep to then start doing your research, it's far better to be prepared. So when that stuff comes, that we're already equipped with not only information for us, but for our people. So I definitely have uh, done some digging into it myself. Cool, cool. Um, so, oh yes. Yeah, so uh, Michelle, could you read this for us? In the final part of the vision, Crowdy was given a book, which he ate in reference to Revelation 10.10. The book contained the seven keys or revelations of the Holy Bible, which included a ban on wine, ritual foot washing, and a version of the Eucharist or Lord's Supper, a holy kiss greeting, and strict adherence to the Ten Commandments. At its start, the Church of God and Saints of Christ adopted practices that ha had gained favor among holiness churches of the Great Plains. Adopting Hebraic practices did not mean rejecting the language of Christianity, at least initially. The seven keys were the plan of salvation, and if they searched the script, if they searched the scriptures according to its direction, they would not go astray, and their blinding eyes would be open to the marvelous light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Crowdy taught chosen people the rise of American Black Israelites religions, a book by Jacob S. Dorman. Right, and and even though we the Hebrew Israelite community is definitely not monolithic. But there are some things that are, we see patterns, right? And a lot yeah. of these movements begin with this vision, right? He had this vision and they they, they try to change and, and tweak, quote unquote, mainstream Christianity because they, they need to show that they're different, right? Even though they're coming from the same text. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll, they'll downplay certain things, but they'll, highlight other things, right? Like a holy kiss greeting, you know, and washing of the feet, which is, you know, some some mainstream Christian churches do that, right? Yeah. And um, actually this particular church, right, exists today. In fact, this this is their 2018 Passover first night March. Um, I have a friend who goes to this particular um, ministry and he invited me to come to, to Sabbath service. It was in Brooklyn. I was curious. I went, 
You know? what service now, bro? Uh, it's called the Church of God Servants of Christ, Crowdy's Church. Mm -hmm. Like it's still going, still, you know, they have one in Brooklyn. And I have a friend that 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 goes to this and he asked me to go. So I'm like, you know what? This is great field research. I'll go. They they meet yeah. on the Sabbath. Uh what, what's interesting is they were able to to um there was a a, a, a Hasidic Jewish temple that actually sold their synagogue to them. So they meet in this actual Jewish synagogue. And again, right, the Hebrews are not monolithic. These guys, beautiful people, man. Beautiful people. You know, you, the, the, they wear the uniforms. Everybody, they have all, all these amazing rituals. Great. Everybody could sing amazingly. <laughs> you know what I mean? And very warm people. Nothing like what we would know as the one Westers. Mm -hmm. Right. These are people that you could sit down and, and have dinner with and have a really great conversation. They are off doctrinally, but good, genuine, warm hearted people. You know, so I don't know if you guys want to say anything about that. No, I mean, I, I for me, again, I haven't seen much of it. I, I've encountered maybe two Hebrew Israelites in my life. And to be honest with you, uh, I was a little excited, you know, so I, I was praying that they were asking, like, what's your nationality? I was waiting, like, you know, like <laughs> the double dutch where you just sit back and you're waiting to jump in um, because I wanted to see how the dialogue was going to go. And, and once once they see the ones that I encountered were not too well versed in what they believed themselves. So once they could see that I was coming with a little bit of knowledge, the conversation just kind of went off, um, you know, and everything like that. Uh, but again, uh, th this kind of information, I think, is very interesting. And unfortunately, I think brothers like yourselves and many others who are putting this information out there, many times it won't get to people until it hits their doorstep. So, right. you know, I just encourage y'all keep posting, um, keep educating, you know, keep the videos up there. That's why I love YouTube and, and, uh, and social media. As uh, Rashard was saying, you know, that's changing the game. It, it may not be a benefit to people now, but, you know, we never know when someone will come back and watch this video or watch sure. another video or read this chapter in the book and how much of a blessing that it will become, which is why I think it's so important for us to overload social media with content like this. Um, you know, and I know voc people like vocab been out there just on the on the front lines yeah, forever in a day. You know, absolutely. so I, I think it's incredibly important. Absolutely. Um, so here's another important figure in, in their history. Uh, Frank S. Cherry worked as a seaman and a railway worker after Jesus supposedly appeared to him in a vision. You see the pattern? Mm -hmm. uh, he, he founded the Church of the Living God in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1886. He arrived in Philadelphia and became a prophet and heir to Father Edward D. Smith's triumph to church and kingdom of God in Christ after Smith's departure for Ethiopia in 1920. Cherry's followers be became known as Black Jews and Cherry modified the costume and teachings of Bishop Crowdy's uh, CGSC. So he's building off of what Crowdy did because he's also a prophet because guess what? He also had a vision, mm -hmm. right? So. And the key key thing in you were yes, saying that yeah. they, everybody has this own vision that they get directly from God. And I, I've always thought that's one of those kind of key markers you look for when a person uh, is off in their theology and stuff and stuff is when they get this secret knowledge from God that nobody else seems to get this personal vision where God comes and speaks directly to them. Anytime I hear something like that, my, I'm like, yeah, you know, my, my antennas go up, you know. Absolutely. Michelle, could you could you read this one for us? Prophet Cherry's theology was strongly millenarian, black nationalist and idiosyncratic. He emphasized strict adherence to the Ten Commandments, and his followers believed in a square earth surrounded by three layers of heaven. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he claimed that Jesus was black and would return in the year 2000 and raise all the saints who obeyed the Ten Commandments in the teachings of Prophet Cherry. Introduction to New and Alternative Religions in America, Eugene V. Gallagher and William M. Ashcroft. I just want to say real quick, it's 2021, y'all, and I'm let that go. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but notice he says that uh, Prophet Cherry's theology was strongly millenarian. Now, where have we heard this term before? The Millerites, mm -hmm. right? And, and what 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 movements do we know come from the Millerites? Them SDA, Jesus Lord. <laughs> the Mormons, the Jehovah Lord. Witnesses, Jehovah's yeah. Witnesses, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So this is another offshoot 
of that. But he does a remix here, right? Because it's it's that, but it's also black nationalism. Mm-hmm. So we don't like black coffee, but we love black people, right? That's the, <laughs> the theology. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, again, right? The, the, the square earth. You know, I know a lot of Hebrews today believe in a flat earth, you know. Uh, what's interesting here is that he was one of the first people to talk about that Jesus will return in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Now, Prophet Cherry isn't part of the One West part of like One West comes much later on. But One West definitely took this from Cherry's theology and they ran with it. And again, me being, you know, a native New Yorker, this was huge. The, the whole Y2K thing with the Hebrews was mm-hmm. huge because I have I had a lot of friends who were Hebrews. So they would run up credit card bills and don't care because they're like, well, Jesus is coming back year two, two, 2000, so it don't matter. Dudes <laughs> will buy new Benzes and crash them. I'd be like, well, it doesn't matter if I can't afford the payments, whatever, because, you know, Jesus, your high is coming back to year 2000. Seriously, people were actually doing that. So when 2000 came and went, uh, it, it, it was it was really bad for a lot of people. It was definitely a shock to their to their systems. Yeah. You know, for me, it's it, you know, at first glance, I'm not going to lie. My first thought is like, man, how stupid can you be? And then, you know, but I try not to be so hard. I kind of posted about that earlier. It really it does expose a little bit of their how how they've been deceived. But what it really does on the flip side is expose how much we've been illuminated because it's not like we so intelligent that we just saw through all the lies. You know, a lot of that, if not all, is God, the Holy Spirit opening up our eyes that we're not so easily deceived, you know, by those things. But my heart really goes out to people that are deceived by that teaching. That they, That's a high level of deception to be, you know, caught up in, in, in all the other good stuff that even after the failed prophecies of those years, like I'm grateful when they lock themselves into a specific date and time, you know, because then when it doesn't come true, hopefully that will kind of spark the, uh, you know, the attention of people to be like, okay, this, this can't be true. Um, but for people who will stay in it after that, it's like, man, you know, like how how far is the deception going to go that even after proof evidence from your own failed prophecies has been exposed, you still stay there. Whereas you won't find that in Christianity. You won't find right. that in our Bible where there is a prophecy that has not come true. In fact, there's just fulfilled prophecies all over the place. But uh, instead, you know, some of those people still um, unfortunately deceived and everything. Well, I mean, the. That failed prophecy played a major factor in a lot of the camps that we know today. And we'll get to that in a minute. Yes. Yes. Just like in SDAs, you had the great controversy was basically built to cover up a failed prophecy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and like Michelle says here, (laughs) exotic math. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. The return. Um, Another figure from this, this movement is Arnold Josiah Ford, an immigrant from Barbados who considered himself an Ethiopian Hebrew and had helped to organize the study group to persuade other black Harlemites that they too were Hebrews. The group became formal in 1924 when Ford joined with colleague Samuel Mose Valentin, uh, no relation to me that I know of, uh, <laughs> and Medikai Herman to organize a Hebrew congregation in Harlem, right? This is part of the, the great migration of, of you know the free blacks moving up to the East Coast, mm-hmm. right? And here's an actual picture of his congregation, Beth but not Abraham. This is on 135th Street in Harlem, 1924. And again, this is not the One West. You know, One West hasn't showed up yet. Look how they dress, right? It looks more formal, traditional, you know, uh, it's a little bit of, of the African culture mixed in with a little bit of the, the Hasidim that you will find in, in New York, you know? So I thought it'd be cool to show, you know, the actual picture. So, oh, yeah. But uh, so you've me... been incorporating, uh, I've had a lot of these sources for a while, especially being up there and everything like that, uh, getting this stuff together, man. That's good. Huh? Now you're making me like my wife is not going to like you when I have to go back and start putting <laughs> all these books in my Amazon cart. Like, <laughs> I'm glad I'm making a few more coins now. I got my uh, own little account where I can do this stuff, you know. But uh, yeah, that's yeah, cool. man, it's 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 great. And, and honestly, you know, a lot of stuff you could just find in Google Images and and you know different you know websites. They'll they'll archive these photos. So you know, we'll we'll, we'll talk behind the scenes. I'll, gotcha. I'll, you know, yeah. So uh, what else we got? So then we have um, 
one of the guys that was mentioned is Mordecai Herman. As you see here, he looks pretty much like a rabbinical priest. Mm -hmm. You know, got the menorah, the, yeah. you know. Um, here's a, a, another photo. This is now the Moorish. Now, notice the name. The Moorish Zionist Temple of the Moorish Jews. Right. Well, we can come up with some names for churches, can't we, boy? I tell you, black people, we, we come up with some names. We, we're good. We're very creative. <laughs> very creative. But look at the synchronicity, though, right? The mm -hmm. Moorish Zionist Temple of the Moorish Jews. And here's the rabbi. He's a rabbi. Look at him. He has the, the, the talit on. You know, he, it's very much, you know, mir mir mirroring the, the, the Hasidic Jews that you would find in the East Coast, you know? And again, this is Harlem. Harlem was was a hotbed for 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 this stuff, right? Um, Rabbi Arnold Josiah Ford influenced and ordained Wentworth Arthur Matthew, who went on to found the Commandment Keepers Ethiopian congregation in Harlem in the nineteen twenties. Commandment Keepers were just one of the many groups influenced by rabbinic Judaism prior to the rise of One West in the nineteen sixties. So as you see here, it's popping in Harlem in the 1920s and, and 30s, you know. So it is, it's we saw a lot of this in the Midwest, but via the Great Migration, we, we're seeing these multiple Black Jewish congregations, and these guys were blocks apart. They were blocks apart, wow. you know. So um, thoughts, comments. Now I, I think it's so, uh, you know. The, explaining all of these little splinter groups and how they can be so closely together. It's like, what is drawing all of these, you know, these, the differences in between them, you know, uh, and everything again, because there's no monolithic teaching in there. So mm -hmm. it, it always gets my mind to thinking, and maybe that's just the way I process information. Like, okay, what is causing all of these break off groups and different things like that? Is it that they just don't agree with a, you know, a, a specific person's theology, or they claim to have some little personal revelation and different things, but, you know, and, and I think that's where some unbelievers get us like, OK, how do we discern what is true when you got all of these different groups out there that can't get together among themselves? So that would be one of the questions I would honestly ask all the uh, if I ran into a group of Hebrew Israelites, I'd honestly want to ask the question, well, how is it that you got all of these groups that call yourselves Hebrew Israelites? But y'all can't even get together on what it is that you actually believe. You know, mm -hmm. some uh, I think I'm gonna say the majority of the time, but um, most of the time with Christians and different things, it, we we all believe in the Bible. We may interpret it different ways, but we have one specific text that we go to that we can all you know that that's um, central to all of us. Um, but with them, I just don't you know see that kind of thing, and it just makes me think, okay, where's what's all the confusion with with mm -hmm. you know just all of these different people believing different things, having different founders. Um, for me, it's just a whole bucket of confusion, man. <laughs> Ms. Turner? You just make me think of like the Hebrew roots movement as well. How like all of this kind of <laughs> spurns so many different camps, but also like things of the Hebrew roots movement. And they're like more, I would say they're probably more closely related to uh, what we've been seeing so far, as opposed to even the one Westerns, because they are they're a little bit more liberal <laughs> than some of the Hebrew roots movements. Yeah. And they, um, and it makes me also think of British Israelism, like how they all kind of have the same kind of claims. I mean, all they're all wrong, but they all have the same kind of claims and they all have these amazing visions that kind of show them um, the same things. Yeah. And then Fredo too, like, let's just say they accomplished their goal of uh, illuminating to all black people the knowledge that they're all Hebrew Israelites. Then it's like, okay, then what? You know, like, so what is the purpose of your group? If you've been called and you received this particular special vision to let all these people know, surely there's gotta be something behind uh, that other than educating people to their national identity. Okay, so now that I know that I'm an Israelite, now what? What am I supposed to do with that information other than sharing it with someone else to let them know their nationality is. That's one of the things I like about the Bible. It's like, okay, hey, it gives a specific purpose. You know, even the Jews had a particular purpose in being chosen. And that's one thing I like Dr. Mason does in this chapter. He's like, okay, even God was trying to bring up the Jews 
to you know set his stamp of approval on them so that they could be a light to the nations so that all of them could be engrafted in and that's clearly explained in right. Genesis 12 when he comes to Abraham and explains to him you know what his purpose is so but right. for them it's like I could never see even in here I'm trying to you know think okay do they even though it's not going to be true do they have a purpose attached to their end game of enlightening people to their identity so it's a very self-centered religion or, or worldview, um, but it's not, it's only focused on what it can do for me, but it's not focused on, okay, what does that knowledge do for someone else or what does it do for the world? And surely it can't be, uh, and I love the fact that he gives the list of all the Gentiles who were mm -hmm. saved, like mm -hmm. it surely it can't be so that only black people can be saved. Like you, you, you gotta, we, we got to think like that, that cannot make it any kind of sense. What God is going to create just black people, but you know, you got all these other nationalities and ethnicities out here right. that we have no plan of salvation for them. You know, it'd be different if he's saying, Hey, we're the Jews and it's our responsibility to go out and, and, and spread the gospel to other people. But it is a very self-centered religion, which is not loving. And so no, for absolutely. me, the whole thing really breaks down in comparison or comparing it with the overall mission of the law and the uh, the choosing of the uh, the Jews in the in the Bible and everything, which he really uh, lays out. And I think that's so good that he 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 really lays all of that stuff out. If you don't understand purpose, you don't understand anything. And that's I know everybody may not like Miles Monroe, but he was so right when he says, you know, when you don't understand the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. So if you don't understand the purpose in God calling the Jews, if you don't understand the purpose of the law, then you're always going to misinterpret, misapply the law because you don't understand what it was created for in the, uh, you know, um, in the very beginning. So that's something right. that I thought he did a phenomenal job of of laying out that whole argument and tying everything in together. No, absolutely. And, you know, th they are trying to answer these two existential questions. Right. Because it, it is about identity. But. They answer incorrectly because the identity is in Christ. Yes. Your yes. identity is found in Christ and become, you know, returning back to your original state of your Margo day. You know what I mean? With them, they stop at their ethnicity. You yes. know, they stop and start there. Like they start there. That's the gospel. The glad tidings is who you are as opposed to who Christ is. Yeah. You yeah. know, but but let's let's keep it moving. So I do want to say something real quick. Yes, ma'am. The gospel is given. In this book, and I guess this book, this gospel is given in this chapter as well. This is very true. Yeah, very true. And here we have a picture of the commandment keepers. And as you see here, you know, they they, they look no different than, you know, Shlomo Rosenberg that you'll find in Crown Heights, Brooklyn or, you know, different other Jewish neighborhoods. Right. It's just the black version of it. That's it. Um And this is where they originally met. Right. This is 87 West 128th Street, 1957. Again, we're still in Harlem. Right. And, and mind you, these these guys are blocks away from one another. Wow. All right. All right. Now, one West was started by Alba Bivens in 1969 mm -hmm. after Bivens broke with a group known as the Commandment Keeper. So he comes from Josiah's uh, movement. Right. He starts his own thing on One West. And the reason why they call it One West, because they met here. One West, 103rd Street, Harlem. So when you hear people talk about One West theology or One Westers, this is why. This is where they actually met his congregation. Right. So the most current iteration of Hebrew Israelism, at least when it comes to the camps, their inception is here. So this is the actual place, right? So, do you think that they're the biggest um, group or the biggest camp within uh, Hebrew Israelism? Uh, well, they not not anymore. I use I I U I C when it comes to the one West denomination. If I use that term, mm -hmm. they are by far the largest, most sophisticated camp out of all the one Westers. You know, and here's a little breakdown. So Alba Bivens that we just talked about before came from the commandment keepers. He started the Israelite school and the four gentlemen you see here, uh, Masha, Waikwa, uh, uh, Ahaya and Shah. These are kind of like the, the church fathers mm -hmm. of the current iteration of Hebrew Israelism. So what happens here it says after a failed prediction by Ahaya that the Messiah would return just January 1, 2000, right? We heard about that prophecy already from, from, from Cherry. 
to kill and enslave all white people, Tazadakia became the leader of the ICUPK and changed the name to the Israelite Church of God in Jesus Christ. And Tazadakia was declared to be the comforter, the actual Holy Spirit in the form of a man. All right. So that's so he continues from the ICUPK. Right. So that's a split there. And then from these guys split and they become the House of David. And from the House of David, we get Nathaniel, which is now IUIC. We have Tahar, GMS and Zabak, which is HOI. And then from the ICUPK breakup is to uh, Tazadakia. And then now we have the ISUPK, which is Yahana. And then you have GOCC, which is Rakar. So all these guys were part of the same group with Abba Bivens. Mm -hmm. But then they split, and then they split, and then so there was already internal beef, but the, the failed prophecy really helped break apart these guys. Did you put this together, bro? Or is this from a, another you can chart? find this? You can find this online. This is this chart. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did I did not. This, yeah, this I'm, is I'm, good, I'm not that man. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that good. So um yeah, man. So it's which is funny, right? Because they, they like to talk about Christians and their denominations, but but look here, right? Same thing, right? Because people disagree and they start their own movements, and then their movement grows, and then there's beef in that movement, and then that movement splits and wash repeats. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, it's crazy. But um, let's 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 keep it moving here. Um, and I just want to say real quick because yes. of the split with um. GMS, we now have um, Sakari. Right, right. And that, that's what happens, right? Because they'll have an issue, maybe it's a doctoral issue or some political issue, and then they'll break off into a new camp, which, Michelle, thank you for that, is Sakari. You know, uh, Eliezer had an issue with GMS, broke forth from them, and now he's created his camp named Sakari, and they've become very well known. And, the, and these are the guys who are most well known within the, you know, the West, the West, one West um, universe. You got ISUBK, Israel United in Christ. You got Christ Church, Sakari, the True Nation. They're lesser known, but they're up and coming. So yeah, so there's there's quite a few here. So now, what I'd like to do is um, talk about some of the major. You know, Mason talks about some of the major critiques that the Hebrew Israelites have of Christians, right? And one of the critiques is. Well, you follow the white man's religion, mm -hmm. right? And but if we know our history, we know that our ancestors who were in the transatlantic slave trade actually knew that the white man's religion wasn't Christianity. Absolutely, they knew themselves. Absolutely. And the reason why we know because we have the slave narratives. We actually have actual interviews with slaves that told us from their own mouths that they saw the flim flam. Right. And here's one, one of those people. This is um, Lit Young. He was enslaved in Mississippi and Texas. It says here she built a nice church with glass windows and a brass cupola for the blacks and a yellow man, light skinned black man, preached to us. She had him preach how we was to obey our master and missy if we want to go to heaven. But when she wasn't there, he came out with straight preaching from the Bible. So he, they already knew. It's like, yeah. you know, we're going to talk, whatever. But when master leaves, we're going to start exegeting this passage for real. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're going to yeah. dig in, you know, um, another uh, example. This is from Claiborne Gantling. He was the slave in Georgia. It says before freedom, we always went to white churches on Sundays with passes, but they never mentioned God. They always told us to be, excuse my French, good niggas and mind our missus and masters. Oh, but they they taught you the Christianity. They said that he teaches Jack. Yeah. And they knew the difference. They knew when they would speak about God or not. They knew our ancestors knew that they, they weren't dummies, people. Yeah. And they, then one of the things that looking at the slave Bible, if you look at how much yes. content they took out of the 66 books, um, I believe it's only 14 of them were actually kept in the slave Bible. And even that that lets us know. That, you know, they even understood, hey, if you give them a full Bible, you can't just stay in that one passage that talks about slaves obey your masters because it's not going to correlate with the rest of the scripture. So, yeah, you know, right. slaves were not stupid, you know. Not just, at all. Michelle, can you read this quote? Mm -hmm. 
They was a lot of talk about conjure, but I didn't believe in it. Of course, them darkies could do everything to one another and have one another scared, but they couldn't conjure that overseer and stop him from beating them near to death. Burton right. Luster enslaved in Tennessee. Right. So it's like there were other competing worldviews in the plantation. Mm -hmm. But the slaves was like, yeah, that don't work either. You know, that voodoo and all that stuff is like sorcery is like, yeah, you, oh, that's nice, but that's not get. You know how they say about Christianity? It's like, where was your God during slavery? Yeah, the slaves were saying that about the voodoo yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing all this enchantments and voodoo is like, well, enchant me out of this plantation, fam. They get me out of here. <laughs> you know? I just, think, I just think it's just hilarious that, you know, they knew. Our ancestors knew the difference. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Gill brought that up too when we talked to her on Thursday. Um, how great show, by the way! Great show. Thank you, thank you. How reading the slave narratives, you get to see how slaves actually thought, what they, you know, believed in, you know, how they felt on a regular basis. And instead of saying, "Oh, you know, they was given this and they were given that," like they literally have their narratives. We have historical documents to show what they actually believe. It's very disingenuous to keep saying. Oh, it's a white man's religion. When we have slaves telling you, no, it's not a white man's religion. And to say, you know, oh, they didn't, they believe this because it was beaten to them. So you feel, you talk about your, your ancestors' wildest dreams, but you don't have no, you don't even believe that they even had good dreams because if you think mm. this was beaten to them, mm. why would you even do it? They're like, you know, I'm a conjure the ancestors. You have no respect for the ancestors if you think that they were stupid enough to accept the religion mm. that was just beaten to them. Mm. So why are you conjuring yeah. your ancestors in the first place? Yeah. Because mm. according to you, they were not bright. So mm. I, I have a, I go on about that. I don't like that kind of nah, stuff. You, nah, you ain't going in. You going in. It's, it's, it's disrespectful to our ancestors to say things like that and not read what they actually felt, what they went through on a regular basis and how they were treated and how they understood the difference between the God that was trying to, that, and as a matter of fact, if you actually look at history, they didn't want slaves to even be um, Christians until yeah. they realized like, oh, we have to beat these people out and getting converts and yeah. they came to try to convert them and it's like, like we're not following for that we don't yeah. want that guy that you're talking about yeah so you still don't even have respect for your ancestors because yeah. they were smart enough to say no to the christianity that was trying that they tried to give to them that's like nah we don't we don't want that we want the real liberating christ makes us equal christianity and that's not what you're giving us and it's funny how they will say, people will say that we're following the religion of the white man, but not even really understanding their own African-American history. You know, and it's like, you don't even understand where our people actually come, not just where they come from physical location, but understand what they went through and what they actually believe. You haven't even done your own research on the topic, but you're speaking this, you know, narrative that you've just heard from someone else, but you haven't done the research. So I always right. try to use that as an opportunity to kind of get people to see exactly what Michelle was saying. You know, our, our peoples wasn't stupid. And if you actually do the research out there, you'll be enlightened by a lot of this stuff right. instead of just uh, perpetrating a narrative that you haven't actually done some research and study on yourself. And, and speaking again of ancestors that knew the difference, here we have Frederick Douglass. Kevin, if you could do the honors and, and read this. Quote. Absolutely. I find since reading over the foregoing narrative that I have in several instances spoken in such a tone and manner respecting religion as may possibly lead those unacquainted with my religious views to suppose me in a, uh, an opponent of all religion to remove the liability of such misapprehension. I deem it proper to app uh, append the following brief explanation, what I have said respecting and against religion. I mean, strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land. Yeah, as a former slave, he was like, listen, don't get it twisted. When I'm critiquing Christianity, quote unquote, I'm not critiquing Christianity proper. Yeah. I'm critiquing this nonsense that these yeah. dudes have. Yeah. <laughs> don't get it. Don't let get me, it let me be specific. He said, let me right. be specific. <laughs> right, right. Do not get me confused. So um, another thing, right? Another critique that many Hebrews, not all, but many Hebrews would say of Christians is, well, you guys are lawless. You know, we're about these laws, statutes, commandments. You preach uh, uh, to be super liberal and you're without laws. Uh, Michelle, can you read 1 Corinthians 9, 21? 
the ESV, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Right. So, you know, Paul's talking about how he evangelizes, but he makes it very clear, even when I'm evangelizing people who are, quote unquote, outside the law, I'm re I'm relating, but don't get it twisted. I'm under the law of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. Christians mm -hmm. are not lawless people. You know, yeah. we're under a new contract. So in, in a sense, we're commandment keepers, too. Yeah. But under a new covenant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know, what was really interesting. And in, uh, as much as I had studied Jose or thought I did, I love the way uh, he breaks down the passages that they'll use in Jose, uh, misinterpret in Hosea um, and, and how he breaks down the, the purpose of the law. And the more you understand it, it makes you think, like, why would anybody be out there trying to keep the law? Like, that's just so much pressure. I mean, 613 of them jokers, you know, to to try to do that just really causes you to miss the freedom um, that comes in Christ and understanding the difference between uh, uh, God or Jesus abolishing the law as opposed to fulfilling the law. I mean, Dr. Mason did just a, such a great job of this just won't educate um, unbelievers or Hebrew Israelites. This is good information for believers to help uh, disciple us into understanding the matters of faith and to understanding scriptures that even we might not have a full understanding of. So, I, I mean, I promise you, if you haven't read through this chapter, Saints of God, family and friends, please go read, I mean, read every chapter. But I mean, this book just gets better and better and better. And I love the progression of it. And, and uh, I mean, it, it's not a bad thing. I know to throw out the shameless plug, but I mean, with, with, uh, uh, I always want to call him Dr. Jerome Gay, but with Pastor Jerome Gay's book coming out today as well, mm -hmm. I mean, we're just being flooded with more and more content. And uh, I, I forgot what my man said. It was, you know, we're, we're in the you know digital time. I love the fact that we're getting written, published material that will help us. Um, it was, um, what's my man's name down in Jacksonville? H.B. Charles. Um, and he talked about in an interview that uh, he said, what happens a lot of time is people will say, have you heard of such and so, so and so black preacher? But then they'll say, have you read such and such white preacher? Mm -hmm. You know, and now mm -hmm. we can go say, not only have you, you know, have you heard of this particular preacher, but we got published content now that yes, you sir. can go and read this stuff. And so yes, I sir. love the way that this is done. It was just a phenomenal breakdown and just uh, breaking down a lot of this stuff in the scriptures that they use. Just a great chapter in the book overall. I, I just absolutely loved it. I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, another resource that may, I've seen Mason actually use is this right here. Again, right. Destroying this myth that Christians don't have commandments to keep. It says here. Wow, that's good. There are one thousand fifty commands in the New Testament for Christians to obey. Ten. I mean, excuse me. One thousand fifty. One thousand fifty. And um. Of course, we're not gonna go through all of them, but as you see here, it, like they break it down, you know, seven things to avoid, That's seven good. abstains, three acts, two things to be awake to. Uh, you know, here's some, uh, another part: seventy-four bees, be exciting, glad, be reconciled, be wise, right? So now, the uh, curses. Yes. When you ask I, I most people, say something real quick. Uh, yes, right please now. go for it. I hit an HI with that. We have 1,050 laws because a lot of them don't <laughs> never heard it before. Because he kept saying, Y'all lawless, y'all lawless. I said, Technically, Christianity has 1,050 laws. He ain't know what to do with his house. <laughs> he was so stuck. He was like, Well, um, I never heard that. I said, That's fine if you never heard it. It's still true. I said, Have you read the New Testament? He was like, well, how you get that? I said, would you like me to show you? And he just, and I was, we were supposed to go back and go over it, but he was so flabbergasted and stuck, and he didn't know what to do with himself because they want to get screamed, you're lawless, you're lawless. But I hit him with that, he didn't know what to say. Yeah. All of them was just stuck like, um, whew. <laughs> how do we combat this? Because we have no answer. <laughs> and honestly, and if you go, if you want to play toe-to-toe, -to -toe, right, in the old covenant, there was if you add the other commandments, you have 613. But the new covenant, 1050, fam. I'm, mm -hmm. just, I'm, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you want to play the number game, which we yeah. don't, but if you want to do that and be childish, yeah. we got more commands than you, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> you know I man. Hooked like, on phonics worked for me, you know. <laughs> uh, man, so 
of course, you know, not many, because again, they're not monolithic, but if you would ask a Hebrew Israelite, how does he know he's a Hebrew Israelite? They will come with Deuteronomy 28 and say, we fit the curses. Right, Michelle? How many times have you heard this? I'm so tired of having to say that's that's not even how this works. I'm just so <laughs> sick of hearing it. That's, you don't fit the curses, fam. They're not talking about you. But um, so yeah, so in in the book it says here Hebrew Israelites see De Deuteronomy 28 as a key passage in support of their belief that African Americans, Afro Caribbeans, Native Americans, shout out to Phil Fox, and um and Latinos comp comp comprise the true 12 tribes of Israel. They coupled this identity claim with additional support from Genesis 49. In Deuteronomy 28, Moses lists the blessings the Israelites will experience if they stay faithful to their covenant with the Lord, as well as the curses they will experience if they are unfaithful. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew Israelites claim that the curses in Deuteronomy are prophetic signs that can be used to identify the Israelites as a people. Thoughts? Yeah, I love how he uh, goes and breaks this down. And even in uh, my research on that in uh, Deuteronomy 28, and there's uh, several different, uh, he includes some of them in here, historical times that actual Israelites, Jewish uh, uh, people were actually taken to Egypt. And uh, I love how, uh, I can't remember if he actually breaks it down, but he he goes piece by piece in Deuteronomy 28, 68, and talks about the different uh, parts of that verse, um, you mm -hmm. know, into Egypt again with ships mm -hmm. and shows, you know, with the context of what each one of those particular parts of that verse means. And they always flip flop it, you know, like, OK, Egypt will be symbolic, but the ships, oh, that's literal. So it's like, come on, man. In what verse do you know where there is a literal and a figurative interpretation within the same doggone verse? all trying to fit into the narrative of what you want it to fit in. And this is kind of one of those, this is one of those reasons where uh, I think, you know, you really get good at doing apologetics when you, you're you doing it and not just, you know, presenting it in live, all this stuff is good. But I would love to have an actual conversation with an Israelite and ask them, hey, hey how do you explain that these verses, these you know things were actually literally fulfilled already. And there are multiple people who are not Christian, non-biblical sources that can attest to that. They have no reason to lie. You know, so what is your response to this and, and see what happens when you, you know, enlighten them with the, you know, historical truth right. that this stuff has already been literally fulfilled, you know, and then just asking them basic questions. Um, you know, it, he he I really love the fact that he went piece by piece um, and breaking this down to help us and prayerfully help some of them that will read this chapter. And I can't remember if it was you, Fredo, or somebody else was saying, uh, I think it might have been Dr. Mason himself, how ever since this book came out. Um, there had been a whole lot of silence in the camps and different things as far as a response to this. Like, if I know I have the truth and everything that I believe about Deuteronomy in 20, as soon as something like this comes out, I'm going to be all over my timeline just going in. I have yet to see a response. Just like uh, uh, Adam said today, I'm going to be on your timeline. Every time you put something <laughs> false out there, I'm going to be all over you. So where yeah. are they? You know, like, if, if man, you know, so again. Because like, the book's I been out like now. It. How long has the book's been out now? Two months? Yeah, had to be two months. It came I out. Haven't seen, I haven't seen. I haven't seen an actual Hebrew Israelite response video yet to the book. Yeah, they're not, not going to. They're not going to. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you and, read this? You know, you you got to be strong and rooted in your faith or your belief to read this and then still come away with what you actually believe. Um, you know, and he, I don't even right. know if they actually have apologists. Um, and different things who, you know, they make it their business to do stuff like this. But, man, come with it. You know, we waiting. But it, it, it's, you know, uh, as Trey Young said, it was in game one. Uh, sorry, Fredo. Mighty quiet out there. You know, it's, my, it's OK. <laughs> it's my okay, bad, man. man. Too early. <laughs> That's all right. No, it's fine. It's fine, man. It's okay. Y'all choose violence every day. And it's, it's okay. It's all good. Okay. Y'all in the U.A. got to stop it with all oh, this violence man. everywhere no, y'all go. I love New York, so it's, it's all oh, good. So, yeah, okay. so that's why you wore the shirt so you could throw a shot at me so I can feel better. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. That's I may not be like, from the city, but I am from New York, okay? I know it's totally mm -hmm. different land, but, you know, nevertheless, let's move Very on if I get embarrassed. So good. <laughs> and, yeah, we're about to get out of here. I mean, there's so much stuff that we can show, but I want to show this last scripture here because they always talking about they fulfill the, the curses, right? And you said yourself, Kevin, that throughout history, we see Israel getting hit with the curses. Well, this is one of those times. In Daniel 9, 11, he says, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice 
and the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the son of God, have been, past tense, been poured Absolutely. out upon yeah. us. Yeah. Because we have sinned against them. Yeah. Right there. I'm just and, and that's just one. I mean, there's more. I can't even, I mean, I, I did the show with uh with CMB and SOC where we went through the prophet Amos and how he went curse for curse in his book. Jeremiah, when he does lamentations, he shows how curse by curse is fulfilled during his time. Yeah. In scripture. So it's like, and it's not prophetic, it is a breach of contract. Mm -hmm. It's not prophecy, right? Yeah. So but um, so yeah. So with that being said, guys, uh, we got two minutes. So what's your final thoughts about the chapter? Go ahead, Michelle. I just want to say something real quick. It's not really going to be my final thoughts. Christians, if we out in the streets doing evangelism, this will not be a problem. And I'm telling you from experience, me and my friends, we go out, we do evangelism in this neighborhood. We go out two times a month religiously well we haven't been a lot since coronavirus but before then we went two times a week every time we talked to the people they knew us by name they would be out there looking for us and so some hebrew israelites came sit on the corner with their megaphones start being loud and acting the food and so i started you know engaging with them because i mean <laughs> i'm for the streets for real and so uh so i started engaging with them and the one guy disrespectful. I didn't, I was, well, cause I was beating them up with the scriptures and they liked that. And they're like, yo, woman, they start trying to be disrespectful. The people, because we came out religiously, ran them off the corner. I didn't have to do a lot of work because the people did it. Because we went there and we ministered the gospel and we talked to the people. We were there with the people. We walked with the people. We helped them meet some of the needs that they had in the community. We even got, um, the Muslim store owners to even participate in some of the stuff that we were doing wow. um, as Christians because we were very diligent in the work that we were doing to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing evangelism. So if we are out there in the streets, it would deter a lot. Of, they ain't been back there. When I tell you they ain't never came back and the people was like, y'all don't come back around these parts no more. We don't care what you got to say. We don't care whose nationality you are. You just going to get out of here because the Christians were out there faithfully. Had we not been out there faithfully, it might have been a different outcome. So we wow. need to be in the streets giving, giving people the word of God. So when things like this happen, it, it, they won't be ready for what they're gonna get. So. Absolutely. Wow. I, I'll make it my final thought and just continue on what you said, Michelle. Um, it was Dr. Jan Carol Van Balen who said in the chaos of the cults, the cults are the unpaid bills of the church. Um, so if we do our homework, if we become uh, allow ourselves to be illuminated by the scriptures and understand what the truth of God's word is as it pertains to the scriptures that they use out of context, it will stop them from being able to grow and prey upon people who do not know these things. So all of us have the solemn responsibility to make sure that we educate ourselves and they've helped by making it easy. We don't have to go and do the research all on our own. You've got urban apologetics. I mean, the, the information you put out there tonight, BK, was incredible, man. And I got to get with you afterwards to uh, see where I can acquire some of that. But it, it, there should be a growing desire within us to become more educated and equipped so that we can empower our people so that they find their identity in Christ and not in their, et their supposed mm -hmm. ethnic origin. Everything that we need, all the answers, the solutions that we need are all found in Christ and his word and his plan for our life. And if we find that, then we won't need um, anything that they're offering us from their particular worldview. So uh, again, I enjoyed today. Looking forward to next week, man. So let's just keep it going. Amen. And that's a great way to wrap it up. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Flo Delicata. And we're out of here. The Bodega's next. Peace.